Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two of episode five of the Moving Science Podcast, focused on advancing health equity in multiple sclerosis care. Again, I'm Quita Highsmith, Vice President, Chief Diversity Officer at Genentech. And as a reminder, I'm joined by the one and only Mitzi Williams. Dr. Williams has over 15 years of experience in neurology, multiple sclerosis, and health disparities. Before we begin, if you have not listened to part one of episode five, I encourage you to check it out right now and then come back here and meet with us. We discussed Dr. Williams' career that led her to founding her MS Center. She also gave us her insights on the existing disparities in MS care and the unmet needs of multiple sclerosis patients that need to be urgently addressed. All right, following where we left off on part one, where you discussed the existing disparities in MS, how can innovation address or even prevent these disparities? Quita, always a pleasure to speak with you um, and about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart and that I'm passionate about. So we talked about disparities and how there's so many different groups that are considered underserved. You know, we touched on ethnic minority groups. We touched on rural populations, LGBTQ plus populations, as well as some of our age related populations, whether it's pediatrics or those who are over a certain age um, that are not part of our clinical trials. And there's this need for data to better understand, you know, what is keeping people from getting to the doctor, what may be interrupting care, as well as what may be interfering with medication regimens, et cetera. And so innovation really is key because we've been doing things a certain way, you know, for many years, and that's gotten us to a certain, you know, to a certain point. MS treatment has, you know, uh, absolutely improved over time through many of the efforts of, you know, our industry partners and research studies, et cetera. But now we've got to go back to some of the basics, right? Understanding the people who are living with these chronic diseases, understanding their situation, um, how social determinants of health, such as their access to care, education, et cetera, is impacting their ability to carry out these plans, right? Because we can have all the best medications, all the best procedures in the world, but if people can't access them, they're not going to be effective. And so innovation is really important in looking at some of the newer technology that we have, um, looking at other ways to try to reach particularly those who are geographically isolated or maybe in what we call neurology deserts where they don't have access to definitely not an MS specialist, but also not a neurologist. Um, and so how can we use some of these newer tools and technologies and these newer ideas to try to address some of these gaps in care? So I think it's key and it's important, right? Our traditional model has brought us to a certain extent, but now to get to that next level, we've got to be thinking different and we've got to do something differently. And so what are those different things? Like what needs to be done so people with MS actually have access to those innovations? Absolutely. So I think that, you know, there are multiple things that can be done. I think one thing just kind of backing all the way up is making sure that people have access to clinical research and clinical trials. And I'm sure that we'll talk about that at some point during this conversation. But that's number one, right? Everybody needs to be included, right? Because when we're coming up with solutions, it's very difficult to apply a solution to a group that was never included in the plan or the concept. And so that's the first thing that definitely needs to be addressed is increase in diversity in our clinical research trials. Um, I think another area, you know, where there can definitely be bridging of gaps is looking at the use of things like telehealth, right? Um, making sure that people have access to broadband, internet service, et cetera, so that they can access telehealth. And how do we connect community, um, local clinicians with maybe some of our experts, you know, for difficult cases, et cetera. And so, you know, I think there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, but certainly it goes back to uh, making our trials more inclusive. It goes back to addressing, you know, education in the patient community about the symptoms of MS and the importance of starting treatment early. Um, and then also going back to our clinicians and educating, you know, our clinician communities that, you know, MS can occur in anyone. We need to be looking for it and we need to be on top of it um, and making sure that people are accessing specialists and specialty care as soon as possible. 
let's talk about clinical research, right? Mm -hmm. We know that Black and Hispanic populations are very underrepresented in global clinical research studies. I'm talking about less than 5%, right? right? And we know that the majority of the patients aren't even asked to participate, even if they have the disease. How, and you know, there's a whole host of reasons, oh, that we don't think they want to participate, this, that, and the third. But the reality is, when you ask the patient, are you interested in participating in clinical research, 83% of them will say yes. Why do you think that historically underrepresented people are not even asked to participate in the very thing that could really make a difference for them? Yeah, I mean, so that's a question we could spend a whole three podcasts on, Quita. But, you know, the short version is there is an assumption, right? So there is an assumption that people will not do it or that people will not be compliant with the research studies. And so, you know, when someone is conducting a trial, they're going to try to get a group or population that they think um, obviously will be the best person in the study, that will stay in the study, that will keep up with the visits, et cetera. And so I think that definitely bias plays a part in it. And I think that, you know, also we have to make sure that we're taking the extra time to educate people about the study, you know? So um, just like we would make sure there was appropriate education for, you know, any project, if there's extra time that's needed, we need to not make snap decisions to not involve people in the research if they have hesitation. I think also sometimes getting family or other people who are decision makers involved um, in that process can be extremely important as well. Um, but I think that people are not asked because there's an assumption that they won't do it, maybe based on a previous experience, maybe based on something else. Um, but, you know, the first step is that people have to be asked. And one of the things that I really believe is that we've got to go into the community to educate them on the value of clinical research. I have this saying, the four B's, the bishop, the barbershop, the beauty salon, and the bodega. Like, that's mm-hmm. where people are congregating. And so if you want to have a conversation, you got to go into the community. But the thing that I want to talk to you about right now is I remember years ago when I first met you, you had this vision around doing a study focused on Black and Hispanic patients to better understand MS. Talk to the people about how that vision came about and what inspired you to want to uh, double down and get this information. Yeah. So I remember too, um, you know, and we've come a long way since then, you know, again, kind of going back to, you know, going to meetings uh, as I, you know, began to get further in my career and sit on steering committee meetings and all of these other projects. And the first question would be how many black people were in the study? And most people would be like, ah, not that many, or, eh, you know, it is negligible. Right. And so there's this hunger for information. And so I'm like, well, these are the people that I'm seeing. And when I'm looking at the trials, they're not a part of these trials, right? Most of our trials for MS are conducted primarily in Eastern Europe. You know, the the amount of people involved in the U.S. is increasing, um, but they're very homogeneous populations. And so it really was out of this idea to find out about these populations, um, but to do it in a systematic way. Because the other challenge was, you know, if you published a study based on, let's say, my center and three other centers, then, you know, people would say, oh, well, you know, that wasn't a clinical trial. So that's not good research or that's not the gold standard. So let's do the gold standard. And so that's really uh, where the CHIME study was born. And certainly there are many other, you know, colleagues, um, Dr. Liliana Amescua, others who had this same vision. And we were very intentional about how we created this trial um, to make sure that we were Um, serving these populations well, um, and that we were being very intentional about how to recruit them into studies. Um, And so it is very exciting to finally see that come to fruition and to begin to report data on some of the results. We actually just finished the second year of the trial. And so for those that don't know, CHIMES is a a study that evaluated um, disease activity and neurological biomarkers in African-American Hispanic patients with MS. And it was, you know, to provide more 
uh, focus on the disease. So why don't you tell us like why this was groundbreaking and what have been some of the results? Because to your point, there was a, there was a lot of fake news um, that people don't want to participate in this in a study like this or they wouldn't do it. Right. And you did this study in a pandemic. And I think it was one of the fastest enrolling studies that we've had. Talk to them about it. Yeah, so this was amazing, right? Because it really was a proof of concept, right? So, you know, we enrolled Black and Hispanic American individuals with multiple sclerosis. Um, it took us three years to get the protocol created. We were very intentional involving advocacy group representatives. We involved patient advocates in creating the protocol. And so it was very unique in that sense is that it really was a multi-stakeholder effort. And there were things that, you know, even some of us, you know, who are members of minoritized communities as clinicians were like, yeah, we shouldn't do that. The people are not going to go for that. And the patient is like, uh-uh, uh-uh, we want the best study. Do the best study, right? And so just having that input and that balance, um, I think was really, really groundbreaking. I think the second piece was that we started enrollment at the height of the pandemic in July 2020. Uh, so there certainly were barriers because many research centers weren't open. Um, but regardless, despite that, we over-enrolled by 25% two months early in a group of people that people say don't want to be in trials. And I still have people asking me about it when I go to programs, like, is it still enrolling? And I'm like, no, unfortunately it's not. But it's a proof of concept, right? People do want to be involved when we are intentional about the way we approach them and doing the studies. We were also very intentional about the sites that were involved, the researchers, right? We tried to get as diverse a population of researchers um, as possible and those who were serving these communities. And that really made a difference. And I think, you know, the, the biggest part is intention. Um, we reported the first year of data. We reported some studies just about the concept of how we created the trial to make it successful. Um, and those have been very well received. Um, you know, in terms of the data, the patients have done really well. Many of them have had access to treatment early and so have done really well in terms of their outcomes, very similar to what we saw in our larger clinical trials. Although we can't directly compare, we can kind of, you know, look at the results and see that they did similarly. And we'll also have a lot of information about genetics, about gene genome sequencing that we've not had in this large, um, although it's a small number, large population of Black and Hispanic people. So we have access to data that we just have never had. And the other piece that was the icing on the cake was that we were able to compare to a site in Kenya, right? And everybody says there's no MS in Africa, uh, but there is an MS center in Kenya. And so that will help us to begin to scratch the surface of, again, MS in populations that people say don't get MS, where it may be limited by resources, et cetera. And so it, I'm really excited about it. it. Literally is a dream come true. Um, and we're just scratching the surface of some of the data and the findings and the learnings um, that will help so many people living with MS. You mentioned access to, to therapy early is really needed. We touched on the MS Innovation Challenge in part one, developed by Roche and Genente to drive real change towards providing early detection in MS, enabling early and efficient treatment, as well as improving monitoring and prediction of the impact of the disease on people's lives based on what you know and chimes. What's missing in the MS space that we should consider? So I think this the piece that needs to be more in the forefront is the patient voice. So there are many things that we, you know, as healthcare providers can bring to the table. Certainly we can bring their pay, their stories. We can bring our experience to the table, but there is the rise of the patient advocate, people who are really out there um, creating their own organizations, speaking about their experiences or representing large communities of people living with MS or other chronic conditions. And so I think that is the piece um, and the balance that we need to bring more to the forefront. Because at the end of the day, if we say that the work that we're doing is to improve these people's lives, then these people need to be a part of the conversation. And so I think that is something um, that definitely is needed and something that is not as absent as it used to be, but still could be brought more to the forefront. And so as we think about increasing representation in MS, research, 
Like, what are the, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're participating in a number of studies. What are the things that you are bringing forward to the patients to get them to participate that the industry can learn from? So I think, you know, certainly acknowledging the hesitation and the reason behind hesitation, if it's there, is important, right? Because we have to acknowledge the past in order to be able to move forward. And so I definitely recognize and understand if there is hesitation that there are reasons behind that, right? And it's not just about historic events like, you know, the syphilis study or the experience of Henrietta Lacks. It's people's current day interactions. If they go to the doctor and they're dismissed, um, if they are told that their symptoms are because they're having anxiety or stress, et cetera, those current interactions reinforce some of those older things that have happened and, you know, make the experiences, you know, suboptimal or poor experiences. And so I think we first have to acknowledge, you know, the reason behind people's hesitation, but also bring to the forefront, you know, why inclusive research is important, right? Everybody has to stand up and be counted to be a part of the solution. And we want to make sure that the solutions apply to everybody. And not only that, there are many benefits to research, right? It is cutting edge medicine, often at some of our premier medical centers. Um, It is not poor care. It's actually excellent care. Um, It's very closely monitored. There are many benefits. And so I think that, you know, of course, discussing those benefits, acknowledging the past, but also making sure that we um, help people to understand that, you know, their contribution um, would really change, potentially change the face of how we practice medicine and how we treat chronic diseases like multiple sclerosis. Yeah. You know, I, I firmly believe that we are in a moment, an inclusion moment, right? And, and we have the opportunity to be proactive um, when it comes to patients, to build trust, and really to be agents of change so that the patients can get the treatment that they deserve and they can live their best lives. In closing, what do you want listeners to take away from this podcast and go back and tell their family, their friends, their colleagues about what's next in multiple sclerosis? I think what's next is really addressing holistic care. I think that scientifically what's next is trying to find a way to reverse damage and ultimately to find a cure. You know, we've always been very scared or hesitant to say that word, but I think that we're getting closer. And so I think that that's important. And the other piece that I would say is that research is important and that it's cool. I think It's important for folks to know that a clinical trial may not be for you, and that's okay. But there is a way for everyone to be involved in research, whether it's a survey, whether it is a study about diet or exercise. There's so many different ways to contribute. And certainly we want people to be in clinical trials, but my encouragement is always to get in where you fit in, right? So if you want to dip your toe in and do a survey study, um, then do that. And also recognize that research is all around us. You know, we do research all the time, whether it's to find a school, to find a car, uh, to find a new stylist, you know, and so it's a part of our culture, um, but we get a little bit more, you know, hesitant or scared when we think about it in a scientific sense. Um, But we're all looking for the same thing, ways to improve life and improve outcomes and ways to do better and live our best lives. All right. All right, Dr. Williams, I asked you on part one, If you could summarize this podcast in one sentence, what comes to mind as we close up part two? Making research inclusive is urgent and it takes all of us to find the solutions. All right, there you have it. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for joining us today. And thank you all for listening. Be sure to check out our previous episodes and stay tuned. (laughs) 